Good evening. This is Laws 11057, Introduction to Law. This is Week 2, Term 3, 2015, and it's the 18th of November 2015. Um, last week I got behind, I must confess, and I was talking in general terms about the study of law, what you can expect during the course, how you go about doing your studies. Now I'm going to start by asking if you would come in nice and close to the head, um, my head to the uh, TV and listen very carefully because I can't shout this out too loud. So we can't tell everybody about this. But the fact is that practice of law isn't all that difficult. And um, if you're charging four or $500 now, you'd think it would be pretty tough, but it's actually pretty easy. But let me give you a few hints. The first is, it's not a bad idea to specialise. If you specialise, you'll find that the money comes to you much easier. That is for those who wish to practise. Um, and the second thing is you need to be prepared and fit and ready to go. Um, so if you can keep those things in mind, then practising in law isn't that hard to do. But there are a lot of traps and a lot of pitfalls. And you might say to yourself, how can I reconcile those statements that it's not that hard with the fact that, according to the studies, more law students will have depression and suffer stress than any other discipline, and practicing in law mirrors that result as well. There are a lot of lawyers that suffer from mental health issues, depression, same with law students. So how can I, on the one hand, say it's pretty easy, on the other, that you will suffer stress or be likelihood of suffering stress. Well, I guess what we need to do is just accept that there are some things that you need to consider undertaking right from the start during the course of your studies that will help you to get through your study and also help you to get through the practice of law. We talked about some of those last week. And it's likely that I'll be asking you some of these things in the examination. So really practical things that we talked about last week are important, and I'm sorry to harp on it, but you need to maintain good health, have some good diversions out of the um, arena of study and work, keep very fit, eat well, keep off the alcohol, all those sorts of things, and be prepared. We talked about preparedness last week, and that applies to your study, and also it applies to your practice. So last week, as a practical exercise, we said, well, maintain a little book or a file where you keep all your notes about exam. Why do we do that? Because we look forward, we think to ourselves, when it comes to exam week, we're going to be under pressure, we're going to be under stress. Let's do something now that will help us to, to get through that period of time at the end of the day. So looking backwards is a theme that you'll hear me repeat often in terms of... Um, the work that we do. Okay, so law isn't all that hard, particularly if you specialise, which is really a case of don't do what I do, do what you should do, because um, I specialise in my practice doing criminal law, that's my day job, but at CQU I do environmental law and ADR, and today I was hearing cases in QCAT, hearing matters that relate to guardianship, so I kind of like the challenge of doing different things, but it's probably not the way you should go, uh, particularly if you want to try and leave your stress levels down. Okay, so let's talk about the study of law. It's not a scientific process. It doesn't start at A and finish at, at, at X or whatever it might be. It's not linear. And um, so there is not necessarily a thing what the, we can describe as the law. It's fluid and it's cyclical to some degrees. Okay, so you're aware that the law is made by Parliament, yes? Get a few nods, yep, yeah, all right. So Parliament makes legislation, but law is also made by judges. Is that the case? Do we have a, an agreement with that? All right. And so the law that's made by the judges is what we call the common law, um, or case law, as the case may be. And I'll just go to gallery view, so we'll see who's here joining us live. Oh, we've got lots of people, that's great. And by all means, you can leave your camera off. But if you put your camera on so we can see you, that's nice as well. And please unmute or use the chat facility if you wish to ask a question. So law is made by parliament, but it's also made by judges. Who can tell me uh, which law, which type of law takes precedence? Legislation, 
or judge made law. You can use the chat facility. Yes, Sheila? Judge made law is the one that takes precedent. Yes, judge made law takes precedent, but only in relation to cases. Um, and here's the thing, this is why I say it's cyclical, because, okay, let's assume that Parliament makes a law that says a certain thing, you know, um, you must wear yellow shirts on Fridays. Um, and then there's a dispute. Somebody wants to argue about what that means. Um, and the judges make orders or they make laws in relation to that particular thing. Now, when it comes to the election time, the opposition say, we think that's a silly law, it should be repealed. And they the opposition gets in. So the first thing they do is they repeal the, you must wear yellow shirts on a Friday law. Sounds a sensible thing to do. So what that means is that any laws that were made by the judges in relation to that particular legislation are now overridden by the new legislation. So you can see that it works in a bit of a cycle here. Parliament creates a law, judges consider it, they make new laws based on that law, then Parliament comes in and they overrule that law again. So the general rule is that legislation will overrule the case law. And the... the um, uh, courts will consider it and they'll consider how the law works in practice. But the study of law is constantly changing. So it's really very difficult to say at any one point in time, this is the law, because it's always open to interpretation and it's always open to new laws coming in. And the other thing is that laws are created in a number of different regimes, a number of different areas. So it may be, for example, that we have contract law, constitutional law, torts law, environmental law, um, criminal law, company law. All of these different areas of law work together to create this thing called the law. So what I want to say is this. Just be very careful about a simplistic answer. There is not necessarily going to be a right or wrong answer. And I think I mentioned that last week, that one of the advantages that we have is that we can come to a different conclusion and still both get 100% marks. So there's not necessarily going to be a right or wrong answer. Often there will be, but not always. So just be wary of a lawyer or who says, this is the law, there is no other way of looking at it. Um, Paralegals can sometimes think in terms of black and white um, as opposed to thinking, well, okay, it may not just be in relation to contract law. Maybe I need to consider consumer law or constitutional law or something else. So just be aware of that other, um, that, that fact that there may be other ways of looking at it. Okay, um, I'm just going to ask a quick quiz just to get you going on the keyboards because we're not seeing much typing. Can anyone tell me their favourite legal book or movie? Something that relates to the law? Maybe movies. Let's go with movies. Has anyone got a favourite movie that they would recommend in relation to legal practice? Legally Blonde, To Kill a Bonking Bird. They're good answers. They're on my list over here. Legally Blonde, To Kill a Bonking Bird. Not a movie, but it Suits, the TV show. I haven't seen that one, Bill. I'll keep an eye out for that. The castle. I love the castle. That's great for constitutional law. Thank you, Emma. Suits, a few good men. Ah, yes, you can't handle the truth. Um, Luke and uh, someone else. I've just missed the who were first one in on that one. A few good men is very good as well. Um, the judge. I like the judge. Um, yeah, the judge is with, um, oh, remember, who was that? William? No. William Durbell? No. Um, but it was great. Robert Downey Jr., yes, was in The Judge. Yep. And I'm trying to think who his dad was, The Judge. It was a great movie. Um, there are a couple of... Uh, yes? Has someone wish to say something? All right. A couple of others. In the Name of the Father, I think, is a really good movie. If you haven't seen that, that's um, uh, a terrific movie about uh, terrorists and um, well worth watching. Legally Blonde, My Cousin Benny's good too. Um, 12 Angry Men is great. There's a 1957 version if you haven't seen that. That's worth watching. Watch out for Juror Number 8, played by Henry Fonda. 
and Philadelphia, of course, as well. So a lot of good movies. Um, during In You Crew, if you want to inspire others and give others some thoughts about what you found to be an excellent movie or book or TV show, Suits, I'll have to look out for that one. Please feel free to um, share that information. Um, now, I take it that you've all had a good look at this one. I know that it's not, catch me if you can, I like that movie too. Um, our textbook at the moment is The New Lawyer, but it's not part of the prescribed reading yet, but I want you to start reading ahead. Erin Brekovich was great too. Um, and have a look at the legal research skills. We really need to do everything at once, um, which is fun. Embrace that, you know, and don't be afraid to grab a bit here, grab a bit there. Remember, the process of law is not linear and really the study of law should not be linear as well. So as you're studying, don't be afraid to go off on a few tangents. Keep it under control because you can spend a lot of hours and, and go down a lot of rabbit holes the wrong way. But don't be afraid to just explore a bit and move around. So I've got two big screens in front of me and I use them more. I want bigger screens um, so that I can have five or six different pages open and I can check out a case and have some legislation here, uh, have some notes here, prepare some other things. So um, be prepared to just explore and have fun with it and go um, and become a bit adventurous. The other thing about law, and this is all designed to help you in terms of coping, is collaboration. I really do encourage collaboration. And <laughs> the first exercise that you've got is, to some degree, to trying to decide the difference between collaboration, which is excellent, and collusion, which um, is, is frowned upon. And, it, and it's a grey area. I appreciate that. But do try and collaborate, share information, uh, share your thoughts. Use the forums, Ucrew in particular, and I'm, again, I'm really happy with the way people have embraced Ucrew. That is um, really important. Okay, so how are you going with these different platforms? So you, at the start, before we started term, you must have thought, what is all this? Moodle, Ucrew, um, you know, I've got, to, I've got to do Zoom. I've got to learn how to use that. Just in a word, just using the chat facility or come in live, have you coped with that? Have you found it? Okay, so yes, yes, all right, thank you, Luke. Just great, oh, that's good, I like that answer. The more you use the programs, the more familiar that you become with them, that's good, thank you, Bill. Okay, so we're coping, um, but you may need to help others out as well. Getting there, thank you, Jay. It's not easy, but it's fun, and osmosis is a good way to learn. Yep, I think that's right. Just um, as you're learning, just be really careful to look at the detail and um, it can help you. I, I mentioned osmosis in the context of how you reference material. What's the right way to do it? So just, just keep an eye on what others are doing and uh, learn and, and help each other. Now, the first paragraph of Chapter 2 of A Practical Guide to Legal Research demonstrates something which I think is really important. And you might think, why am I talking about the legal guide to research because it's not prescribed reading this week? But that's what we'll do. We'll just have fun. We'll move around a bit. So chapter two says, legislation is central to legal problems solving. Okay. Legislation is the largest source of law in Australia and forms the basis of the Australian legal system. Indeed, Commonwealth or state territory legislation or combinations of both influence our law and as the law is constantly changing with many new laws enacted and existing laws amended each year, it is essential for students and lawyers and other professionals to not only have an understanding of the area of the law, but to know how to locate, update and interpret the legislation. Okay, so what that tells me is that the important thing we need to consider at this stage is how we go about finding the law. And what that means is, doing more than just reading the material in the textbook. I really do want you to start finding the law. I mentioned this last week. I prefer you go to the primary sources than necessarily relying on the secondary sources. It's really satisfying if you can find that law yourself rather than the book telling you what the law is. Um, so give it a go. I like Ostley. I like Jade Barnett. Um, LexisNexis is great, but 
don't just go with the ones I like. Start looking at all of the different avenues that are available to you. The free ones online, but also the paid versions that you have access to through the university. And if you have problems, get onto the library and exchange information. Now, part of why I'm telling you this is that Westlaw is great. Thank you, Luke. Um, part of the reason I'm telling you this is, you know, you've all had a look at assignment number three, yes? We all know what assignment three is about. Okay. And it means you need to learn Zoom and it means that you need to learn legal research skills. And you just need to show me how you're using those legal research skills. So please don't leave it to the last minute. Start doing that now. Start working on assignment one and assignment three at the same time. What the heck? Why not? All right? And make notes to yourself. Make sure that you have thought logically about LexisNexis is good. Um, so think logically about what you need to achieve and work backwards from there. So as you come across some information, you've got somewhere to catalogue it. Does that make sense? All right, that's good. If you have any questions, just come in with the chat facility or be brave and unmute your microphone and ask a question or make a comment. Everybody, nobody wants to listen to me all night, I'm sure of that. All right, so in Chapter 3 of A Practical Guide to Legal Research, it demonstrates the importance of common law, our common law system. So just for terminology, we've talked about legislation and I've also talked about common law, but I've used that interchangeably with the term case law. Um, so case law system. So in a common law system such as Australia, case law is central to understanding, interpreting and applying the law. In addition, like legislation, cases provide the necessary authority in support of a legal principle or proposition. It is imperative, therefore, that students can research, locate and update case law. One of the core principles of common law systems is the doctrine of stare decisis that translates approximately to follow precedent and do not disturb things that are settled. And according to stare decisis, a court, and therefore all of us, law students and law professionals, should follow previously decided cases or precedents on the same subject. So, as a primary source of our law, identifying, reading, understanding cases is integral to legal research. Paramount to that is a sound understanding of the Australian judicial hierarchy, the doctrine of precedent, which determines the authority for a decision in a particular jurisdiction. So what do we glean from that? What I glean is that when you're doing legal research, understand how to find your way around legislation and also understand how to find your way around case law. And sometimes the two are mixed. I mean, has anyone found the note-up facility in Ostley, for example? Has anyone found note-up? No, no one yet. All right. It's a really simple facility and it's great. What I'll do is I'll just share the screen for a minute and I'll just show you this one. So bear with me as I go through this process of sharing the screen and hopefully you can now see my other screen and you might be able to see Ostley. You can see that. So if you go into cases, uh, sorry, we'll go into cases and legislation, Queensland. And we then go to Queensland legislation. Let's say we go to the Police Powers and Responsibilities Act. Where is that? Police Powers and Responsibilities Act. And we go down to section... 754, an offence for a driver of a motor vehicle to fail to stop a motor vehicle. All right, so that's the section that we're after. We click on that. It should come up now with the section. A bit slow, but there it is. That's the offence provision, tells you the penalties, etc. Have a look at this one up here. Note up, just sits quietly, but it's great. Click on that. And it will give you the up-to-date cases that relate to that section. How good is that? So we can see the district court this year on the 2nd of April 
decision of Kelly against QPS gives some commentary in relation to that section. It's a 100% match and it's a de decision of his honour, um, Judge Devereux, SC, in relation to that, um, that matter. So, and you can see that his honour has made reference to the section and previous cases decided on it. Um, so that's a nice snappy little case that uh, is on point for that section. So that's the sort of little trick that I want you to discover for yourself. Share that information with each other on Ucrew and then present that as part of your assessment. How much fun is that? All right, so I'll stop the share for the moment. Has anyone got any questions about what we just did? Was that pretty simple? Had anyone seen that before? No? All right, yes, I'm getting a few nods. All right. So that's the note up facility, but there's a lot more than that. Jade Barnett, Westlaw, all that sort of stuff. Share your information and uh, we can then use it from there. All right. Um, in terms of the textbook, coming back to the layout of the new lawyer, which I said last week I think is an excellent text. Part one, chapters one to five, deals with knowing the law. Part two, chapters six to ten, is doing the law. And part three, chapters 11 to 14, is being a lawyer. Threshold learning outcomes. And there are six of them. Knowledge, ethics and professional responsibility, thinking skills, research skills, communication and collaboration, and self-management skills. Now, what's interesting about that and what might surprise you based on what you now know compared to what you thought you knew two weeks ago about the law is this. Of those six threshold learning outcomes, I'll bet that you thought knowing about the law is why you're studying this subject. Yep. Does anyone disagree with that? That's what you probably thought, that you were here to study to know what the law is. Well, guess what? It's only one of the six threshold outcomes that you need to achieve. The other five are just as important. So you need to consider all of that in the context of your study. And you might think self-management, why is that important? And I keep stressing it. You've got to be fit. You've got to be healthy. You've got to have your mind right. You've got to be organized. So that's what I mean by self-management. It's really just as important as the others. Okay. So law is a profession. Originally, when we talk about a profession, we meant that it was self-regulating. So that's, that was the original idea of a profession. It regulated itself. Well, we're way past that. Practice in law now is regulated like <coughs> professions, and that regulation is important, and you need to understand it and um, be, be willing to comply with those legislative requirements. One of the important things that you should do, and if you haven't already done it, I think I mentioned it last week, is get yourself a copy of this from the Queensland Law Society. It's not very expensive. Oh, and what you can do is the document I've just flashed up on the screen there is the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules 2012 in practice. All right. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good document. That will help you in your exam. Guarantee it. So get that. Um, it's not prescribed. I should probably prescribe it, but it's worth doing. Get that from the Queensland Law Society. So if you haven't been on to the Queensland Law Society, there it is, Queensland Law Society. If you haven't been onto the website, pop on there and there's some great material, some really good material in relation to legal ethics and conduct. And you're going to find a lot of good stuff that is going, and that's another exam hint. Yes, thanks, Bill. Um, you, you will find a lot of good material. And look, why not join as a law student, um, as a member, as a student member of the Queensland Law Society? A couple of reasons for that. It'll help you feel more part of the profession. And also, as far as the profession is concerned, you will be able to fly the flag for Central Queensland University. And I really want you to do well in this course. I really want you to be excellent lawyers if that's what you choose to do as a result of studying law. 
and proudly say that you are from Central Queensland University. Okay, so please consider that option, buying the text and joining as a student lawyer. Look, the realities of legal practice are mentioned in the text. Lawyers help people. Lawyers give clear advice about complicated problems. Lawyers are negotiators, advocates. Lawyers read a lot. All of that is true. And I mentioned that law is pretty easy, but there's a couple of reservations to that. The first is that as a lawyer, you're under pressure from all different sorts of things. Now, true story, on Monday morning, I woke up early and I was writing for a couple of hours in relation to environmental law for Central Queensland University. And that's fine. I like that. That's good. But on Monday, I was hearing matters in QCAT. Uh, I had matters in the magistrate's court where I was doing bail applications. So I was in court two. I was doing bail applications in court one. In court three, we had a district court trial starting. And on the same day, I had a Supreme Court matter in Mirabra. And I know you're saying, well, how can you separate yourself into four different ways? Sometimes it's a bit of time management um, and, of course, a lot of preparation and, and a bit of delegation, getting things organised. But if you're in, practising in law, you need to be aware that you're going to have demands on you in all sorts of directions. So, and the other thing is reading a lot. The, the cases are very long and the legislation is huge. I mean, that... That one piece of legislation I showed you, I went down to section 754. So you're going to say to yourself, well, how can it be easy when there's so much there? The point is that you try to develop techniques that will assist you to find what you need fairly quickly, and that's why legal research is so important, um, and be well organised so that you know the key things that you need to do. I hope I'm not putting people off practising law. That's not the intention at all, okay? because you'll all make excellent lawyers, I'm sure. Are there any questions based on what I've been saying? Or prattling, you might uh, argue that I'm prattling. For those of you who don't know what prattling means, it means just wandering aimlessly um, in my discussions. All right, so what are the attributes of a good lawyer? Clarity of thought, yep. Good communication skills, even better listening skills. That is extremely important. Being able to listen carefully is so important. Being well organised, technologically capable, committed, personable, flexible, understanding and tolerant of people and having good analytical and problem solving skills. I think that's a great list. Think about that. Think about you. Um, if you want to practice, where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? Think about how you might work on those things if it is a weakness, to undertake the practice better. Should we read any legislation each week on top of the textbook reading? That's a really good question. I think it's a great idea. Um, and I don't have to prescribe it. There is one problem. I forget which number it is. It might be 33. I'm not sure. But one problem in the material that I've listed, which requires you to um, do a little bit of specific legal research. But why not give yourself, I don't know, 20 minutes just to flick around aimlessly through the websites um, and uh, just see what you find. So that might be a great idea. So thank you very much, Heidi. Um, Osley is not as reliable as LexisNexis, Jade, etc., because it's free. Look, Osley is not, that's a really good question. Osley is not authorised, um, but I find it to be highly reliable. Um, but I, I think Jade is great as well. Westlaw, LexisNexis, I just really think they're all terrific. And if you enjoy reading about the law, then it makes it so much easier, of course. Um, now, I don't know if you want to be a solicitor or a barrister, or you, maybe you don't want to practice in law at all. Maybe you're doing this course for other reasons. And that's, that's great. Most people who have a law degree actually won't practice in law. I, I get that. But this course, what I'm doing, is tailored towards those people that want to um, practice in law. So if you have any other thoughts, if you want to tailor it in some other way, then please let us know. But when you practice your law, you need to kind of have an idea of where you're going. And, and you'll, you'll come across this thing called the Priestly 11. Priestly 11, um, the basic areas of practice. 
So I'll run through them briefly, and I hope I'm not taking too much of your time, but let's have a look at those Priestly 11. Number one, administrative law. It sounds boring. I remember when I did law, I thought, oh, that sounds really boring. Administrative law? How dull is that? And yet now, in practice, I love admin law. Admin law is great. Um, it's what I primarily do. Well, it's what, part of what I do at QCAT. So we, there's a thing called a merits appeal. Um, and a merits appeal is where a court or a tribunal, mostly a tribunal, um, review, sorry, a tribunal considers a, a decision that had been made administratively and the tribunal comes to the correct and preferable decision. A bit pompous, but that's the way it's worded. Uh, I'll give you an example. So if someone applies for a blue card and administratively that blue card application is rejected, then in the legislation it says that the unsuccessful applicant for the blue card can initiate a merits appeal to the tribunal. And in the tribunal, we don't, it's not like a judicial review, we don't actually look at the decision that was made administratively and ask ourselves whether it was made correctly or not in the sense of the procedures, um, we just actually make the decision. So we, we step into the shoes of the decision maker and actually make the decision. Um, and, and it may be to, in essence, affirm what was done or replace what was done um, or impose conditions but that's what admin law is is primarily about. It's actually, you know, considering the decision and um, and stepping in and making that decision again. Or or it can be a judicial review. Judicial review is to a court, and that is where the decision that it was made was made because of some issue, some problem. It may have been bias, or it may have been that the tribunal, that the admin um, decision maker didn't have jurisdiction, etc. So admin law is really interesting. Civil procedure, um, that's really good. That's talking about the way that the, the law is conducted in civil proceedings as opposed to criminal proceedings. And I won't go through the rest, but um, uh, do read about that. Criminal law is really good. Um, if you want to specialise in criminal law, it's great. Uh, it, there's always there's always a lot of work. To be honest, criminal law as a solicitor is not as interesting now as it was five, six years ago, and that is because in 2010, the Moynihan reforms effectively outlawed committal proceedings. So up until 2010, as solicitors, we would typically have the option of conducting a committal hearing and a committal is the process where a magistrate has to decide whether there's enough evidence for it to go to a judge, if you know what I mean. So we had a chance to um, cross-examine witnesses, police officers, etc., cetera, and, uh, and it was very rewarding work, but we're not really allowed to do that anymore, only in very limited circumstances. So criminal law is a little less interesting than it was, but it's still very good. And you need to make that decision as to whether you wish to be a barrister or solicitor, at least in the Queensland context. Probably nine out of ten practitioners are solicitors and one in ten are barristers. Um, barrister, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, what I'd recommend if you want to be a barrister in criminal law is try and get yourself to the courts as much as you can. You'll find that many of the barristers, many of the lawyers are really obliging. They're happy to help you out give you some ideas, some guidance. I invite law students to come along with me when I'm in the magistrate's court. I invite students to come along and assist me in district court um, matters and Supreme Court matters as well from time to time. So if family law is really good. Um, always a lot of work. Very specialised. That Again, you find that many people that practice in family law, that is what they do. Um, and that's a great way to go. Um, on Monday night, Judge Coates of the, the Circuit Court is um, uh, having a CPD session for practitioners. I'm president of the local district law association, Fraser Coast. So in a sense, we're hosting that session. And um, the judge is freely giving his time and a barrister is coming along as well to talk to practitioners. So if you're in the Harvey Bay area next Monday, uh, please come along. 
and uh, you can join us. It's uh, open to anyone to send me an email to say you'd like to attend. Come to dinner with us, uh, with the judge as well, if you wish. Now, there was another question here. Would you recommend sitting in the district magistrates or Supreme Court? In terms of observing all of those, and you'll see a different pace. You'll see in the, in the magistrate's court, it's pretty quick fire, bang, bang, bang. It's got to keep moving. District court, it slows down a lot, and then it slows down even a little more in the Supreme Court. And that, that reflects, um, I suppose, the relative gravity of most of the court um, matters that are going on. And so how do you go about observing? Well, courts are open to the public. So one thing you can do is just walk in and sit there in the public gallery. And I'd recommend it. You know, it, it's not exactly the same as going to the football or to a concert, but it's still interesting and you might really enjoy it. You get, um, and in the breaks, you get to, to learn a lot too because you might hear the um, chatter between lawyers, um, which is always very interesting as well. So make yourself known um, at your local courthouse and uh, do spend some time. If you've got some time to do it, I think you'll find it really worthwhile. Now, except cases to, do, cases to do with children, says Heidi, yes and no, the law changed last year. Um, children's court was entirely closed court until last year. It's now opened up. Uh, children's court is open to the public unless a successful application to close the court has been made. And in my jurisdiction, um, when I'm in the children's court, if a child is under the care of the department, I will apply on that basis to close the court. Or if the child is a first-time offender, I will apply to close the court on that basis as well. But other than that, children's court's open now. Um, you can't go into domestic violence court and you can't go into child protection court. But otherwise, it's pretty much open. All right, so um, Bell says, you've been involved in the QCAT hearing for tenancy matters. Can you please tell me the difference between a magistrate and an adjudicator? All right, now that's a good question. In the QCAT jurisdiction, there are a couple of broad categories. The first category is that we have the minor civil disputes. And if you like, above that, we have everything else. Now, the tenancy matters are dealt with in the minor civil disputes jurisdiction. And I suppose in dollar terms, to be in the minor civil disputes jurisdiction, there's a limit of $25,000. So $25,000 is the limit there. And also the type of matter. So if you have the old small claims tribunal stuff, that's all now the minor civil disputes matter jurisdiction of QCAT. So minor civil disputes induced in QCAT is kind of the old small claim stuff, residential tenancy stuff, and stuff that's up to $25,000. But for the other stuff, and I do, I'm, I'm involved in the other stuff, I don't hear any minor civil disputes. So the other stuff um, is probably all the more interesting stuff. Um, so in that jurisdiction, we deal with guardianship, administrative law that I mentioned before. Um, we deal with building disputes, retail shop lease disputes, a whole range of different things. Um, and that's unlimited jurisdiction. So in terms of dollar terms, in the magistrate's court, the limit is $75,000, minor civil disputes is 25, magistrates is 75, district court is, I should know this straight off the top of my head, 250 I think, or has it gone up? Can anyone tell me? I should know this, it was on the, I said it on the exam, 250, thank you, I said it as an exam question last term, so you'd think I'd know that off the top of my head. Supreme Court is unlimited, and um, interestingly, QCAT is unlimited as well. So in QCAT, we have building disputes and retail shop lease disputes um, and some other things that, you know, are well over a million dollars. Okay, um, so that's one broad thing for QCAT. And the other thing for QCAT is that we have the human rights division and we ha have the civil and administrative on the other hand. And human rights is mostly dominated by guardianship matters, um, you know, um, public guardian, public trustee, that type of thing. And then the other, the civil and the administrative, I've kind of talked about before as well, the building, the admin law, the retail shop leases, etc. Okay, um, in the Supreme Court from high school from Bundaberg. Oh, okay. So Heidi said, went from the 
high school in Bundy to the Supreme Court. That's great. Um, the Supreme Court does sit in Bundaberg. It sits in Mirabra. It'll sit in most regional areas, but on a circuit. And that's the same as the District Court and the Federal Circuit Court. They will go on a circuit sittings, we call it. Are there any circle Indigenous courts in Queensland? Um, now, it's be, the Murray Court was a fantastic innovation. It was disbanded uh, under a previous government. Um, it is being reintroduced, but to my knowledge, it hasn't yet come back into um, operation. I may stand to be corrected on that. If anyone knows that the Murray Court is up and running again, please let me know. It was, it was working. It was disbanded by the uh, former Labor government. Um, no, the former Liberal government, sorry. Um, but it's now being introduced, I'm told. Um, in terms of other types of courts and jurisdictions, um, well, there's a whole range of them. And we'll talk about these as we go. But just briefly, in the magistrate's court jurisdiction, there's um, an adjunct to that is... Um, well, sorry, no, I'll rephrase that. For children, there is the option of um, youth justice conferencing, um, which is kind of a diversion issue. Another diversion issue in the criminal law context is um, drug diversion, where you can go off and do drug diversion instead of having a matter necessarily prosecuted through the courts. Okay, so I'm diverging a bit there, but that's really good questions. Thank you. Um, all right, so we've talked about the different areas of practice and we've talked about how you might gain some knowledge beyond what's in the textbook. So tonight's really, the theme of tonight is don't just read chapter two. I know that's what's prescribed, but broaden the horizon, broaden the horizon in terms of reading other material and sourcing other work and get out there and fly the flag for Central Queensland University as well. Um, the purpose of the first exercise, amongst other things, is for you to understand that your reputation, your professional integrity begins now, it did last week, and reading the case law, you understand how important it is to be practicing with integrity, um, cheating, collusion, all those sorts of things, uh, they may stay with you. And um, that's the point of the exercise to understand that if you want to practice in law, you need to be admitted. It's not just a matter of getting the law degree and you need to pass the test for admission as well. All right. So um, to that end, that's why I say to you, it's really important that you immediately start to get on top of the conduct rules. And that's why that document is important. Okay. All right. Are there any questions? I know I've been talking a lot and I've just about run out of time. But you understand that your legal research skills starts now. Um, I think I've given you some ideas of where you can access case law and legislation, some of the advantages and disadvantages. I think that I put that in the material somewhere, um, you know, explaining Ostley and Com Law, Barnett, Jade, etc. I take it everyone, has everyone subscribed to Barnett yet? Are you getting your up-to-date cases? Have I talked to you about that? All right. It's worth doing. It's worth, and it's fun. You can get some case law delivered to your email address every day. So I really actually, so I know it's silly, but I really look forward to getting my email saying what are the latest cases. Flick through it. See if my name's there. <laughs> Only joking. Um, so course learning outcomes, have a look at that. Um, now, share your work. It's very good karma. I haven't talked at all about the history of Australian law, which is what I'm supposed to be talking to you about. Sorry, John. Yes. Um, there's just been two questions on the chat of how do you how do you just subscribe and how much is it to Barnett? Yes, yeah, sorry. Great. Um, thank you. I'm sorry I missed that. How do you describe, uh, subscribe? Go on the website and just follow the prompts. That should be pretty easy to do. And the subscription is absolutely free. It's great. 
Um, don't tick everything, otherwise you will get thousands of cases. But maybe you could just start by ticking one particular area of practice. So if you're interested in family law or criminal law or legal ethics or whatever it might be, maybe tick a few. But um, let's follow that up in you, crew and um, see if anyone is successful in um, learning how to do that. And who knows, um, you might want to include that as part of your um, your presentation on Zoom for assignment number three, your process for um, registering in Barnett and your experience in Barnett. So in assignment number three, you might want to kind of take a general approach or you might say, look, I'm going to narrow mine in and provide some detail on one particular lit research area or topic. I'll leave you to make those sorts of decisions. Um, a couple of other things. There are think research and revision sections in our textbook. Do I recommend spending more time on these? Would they be useful for the exam? That's a good question. I think the most important revision questions are the one that I post on Moodle each week. But by all means, do the revision sections in, um, in the text. I personally don't find answering the revision questions to be a great way to learn, but it's just me. Other people do. And, and, and I know other course coordinators really stress that and say that's the best way to revise and understand the material by being answered to, uh, able to answer those revision questions. So I think it's great, but it's not, um, it may not be necessarily the best thing for you, if I can be vague like that. Thank you. All right. Um, I take it you've all had a look at my sample document. You've all had a look at the, um, uh, the assessment pieces that we need. And even though I'm behind already, what I propose to do is talk about um, you know, Indigenous law, Indigenous Australians, the history of law, and I'll do that next week, and I will catch up. All right, so can we, Jazz said, can we combine the first and third assignments by showing ourselves working through the first assignment or legal research process? Yeah, you can do that. That'd be good. So what did I say? Assignment number three is really just showing off your abilities online in the sense of um, how you go about your legal research and how you present it. So there's a bit of sales ability that comes into assignment three, don't you think? If, we, if you think about assignment three in the context of what we're supposed to be doing as lawyers, then lawyers' um, attributes are clarity of thought, good communication skills, well-organised, technologically capable, flexible, analytical, problem-solving skills. So I take that as meaning there's got to be a bit of persuasion about your presentation to me, a bit of salesmanship. Who thinks that being an effective lawyer requires you to be a competent actor? Yes, I think there is, don't you? Um, it does help. If, you're, if you want to be a barrister, it helps to be a little bit of a show-off, don't you think? But you can do it nicely, um, and you, you, lawyers are very competitive, and that's part of the reason why there's a, um, uh, I won't say endemic, but there's, there's a high proportion of people that do suffer mental health issues and depression who practice or study law, partly because we are competitive, and um, that's where you just need to, to harness that a bit and embrace it and kind of enjoy it and be prepared to lose just as much as you are prepared to um, win, because you won't win them all. So you're going to be prepared to take a few knocks and a bit of criticism as well. So try and build that into your procedures. Thank you very much for your patience tonight. I know it's been a long session. I appreciate your staying with me in relation to the session. Please continue to share information on you, crew, and I think we might call that a night. Does that sound all right to you? All right. Um, so I'll stop the recording now. Thank you very much.